It has been said that if you wish to see far ahead in time, you must first look far back to find lessons from the past. The archiving of documents from the past and the present is an important source for architecture and design. It captures the passing of time. It is a testament to the evolution of the discipline. The following masterclasses record the individual processes of professionals and their ways of working. Hello, I'm Marcia Reed, and I'm going to speak today about the materiality of archives. I'm the chief curator at the Getty Research Institute, which is the sister program of the Getty Museum at the Getty Center in Los Angeles. Founded in 1983, the GRI is a think tank for art history. And initially, we had no collections. So for more than 35 years, I've had the privilege of playing a significant role in collecting them. The Research Institute now has world-class holdings of rare books, prints and drawings, photographs, archives and manuscripts, as well as modern and contemporary collections, architectural models, multiples and videos. Research value is key to our collections and they have been selected for their potential to create new perspectives that advance and diversify art history. I lead a team of 10 curators who acquire, research, publish, and promote the collections as I do. As a curator, I possess what my colleagues call the acquisitive gene. I collect, therefore I am. In addition to subject and content, what often attracts me to what others would see as just another old book or a scruffy sheet of paper are the physical qualities. Along with what we may know about historical circumstances, it is these physical qualities of the works which take us back to the people, to the places where they came from, to the times when they originated before they were institutionalized. To see simply archives as folders holding texts, or in the case of photographs as just images, reduces them to mere documents from which data and statistics are drawn. It detracts disturbingly from their cultural values. And seriously and very tragically, these kinds of attitudes can truly flatten and erase the evidence that it was human beings who created them. Having survived after their creators died, indeed, they're now all we have. We value them for their authenticity, indeed connecting, connecting to a person, a time, or a place. Through respect and care, we reify and reestablish that connection. There's a particular concern about the effects of digitization, which can truly flatten or erase physical evidence of history and ownership. There's no doubt that digitization is a very good thing. It's a good way of proliferating the evidence, which could be hidden away in the vaults or storage spaces of archives and special collections. No one would experience them. However, occasionally, when I see manuscripts or printed pages reproduced in electronic versions, I want to raise my fist or shout out that these are more than just two-dimensional texts or flat images. With such screen versions, we lose the immediacy, the direct experience, the connection conveyed by the true dimensionalities of the material. Notable physical qualities that tend to get lost in the transition from original to monitor are scale or size, condition, the actual shape, because irregularities can tend to get ironed out, squared up to fit. Most important, the tactility and the quality of the material that holds the contents and then that readers 
see with their eyes, perhaps hold in their hands. We all know this, but I think that in media race, we tend to forget it. And if archivists and curators forget, others who only can view the digital versions will never know, they'll never get it. I will describe just a few examples. The Mamie Clayton Library and Museum in Los Angeles is a collection on the importance of African-American culture that was assembled by Dr. Clayton herself. A very large parchment chart, it's about the size of a small tablecloth, probably from the 19th century, lists the names of enslaved persons on a plantation. The Clayton Collection focuses on the cultural achievements of Blacks in the 20th century with books, recordings, posters, photos, archives, and art. This parchment piece is slightly early for Dr. Clayton's collecting scope. However, it's a stirring document that is evidence of where some of these celebrities' families came from. No doubt, Dr. Clayton was drawn to the documentary content, first names only, ages, and groupings. Part of its riveting presence derives from this document's physical qualities. It is written on a stiff, irregular piece of paper, skin, sorry, instead of paper, it is written on a regular piece of skin. When it's unpacked and unfolded, it's a heart stopper. There's something about a list of human property inscribed on a large piece of bleached animal skin that just makes you stop in your tracks. In a digital version, we see only a flat chart, so it's not the same thing. My next example is a Civil War era newspaper. July 4th, 1863 was the day of the Vicksburg, Mississippi surrender to Ulysses S. Grant. Five days after, Port Hudson, Louisiana was captured. These two victories mark the beginning of the end of the Confederacy. Typically, Union armies would publish an edition of the local newspaper during their occupation of a southern city to spread the news. Having run out of newspaper to print on, the Vicksburg Daily Citizen publisher had been using wallpaper. And so the Union troops also had wallpaper to print on. They reset a column that noted Grant's victory, and they even stated wallpaper edition as this particular one that would become a collector's uh, object, a valuable curiosity. And of course, it's been reprinted multiple times, now leading to the need to distinguish the original mid 19th century wallpaper from the modern reproductions. Coming closer to our own times, a modest 1955 paperback, Hold Langston Hughes's poetry and Roy DeCaravas photos. The sweet flypaper of life, this is what the book's title is, has a deceptively clever design because the text begins on the cover. Looks like a cast off paperback with the covers ripped off. People have told me more than once the cover's missing. The book's spare design is essential to its presentation, to its subject which is life. A brand new paperback edition has taught me a lesson about the importance of materiality. I can't seem to buy it. It's too new. It's too slick. It lacks historic plainness, the throwaway quality that's akin to flypaper. I want to experience the authentic qualities of de Carava's black and white photographs printed on cheap paperback quality paper. I like to take care with a flimsy binding so I don't break it. And the reprint is just too fresh. It's simply not the same 
book. I've started to buy it several times and then I've stopped. I couldn't do it. With visual documents, such as the photographs, like those in the Johnson Publishing Company photo archive, the content of these legacy images is essential to cultural history, not only to African American history, but to all history. It's also important that they're not seen as just pictures, but compositions by a particular gifted maker at a particular time. What's important is the quality of the original photographs that are in the Johnson Publishing Archive and the high quality printing of these original photographs compared with later printings or reproductions in magazines like Jet or Ebony. They're cropped, they're reduced as they were reproduced in the magazines the vintage photographs in the archive reveal the talents of the makers and the dignity of their subjects. And sometimes books themselves can be part of an archive because their meaning is found in that context. Also at the Johnson Publishing Company offices in Chicago, a small journal entitled Ebony was published by a black publisher and writer tucked away in Mr. Johnson, the publisher's desk drawer. Someone had given him this book and written a small note in it. No digital surrogate will be able to convey the feel of the early 20th century paper, the personal scale of this small volume and its militant social and political sent sentiments that were yet to be realized. Not just a book, but this eponymous precursor to Ebony the Magazine is part of the story of the Johnson Publishing Company archive. In its modest materiality, it will lead others back to the roots of the JPC, the Johnson Publishing Company, with cultural connections and with intersections. Thank you. Thank you.